Eh, uh, Sonic Forces, a game that's been getting, well, mixed reception. Some people absolutely love the game, and are even placing it in their favourite Sonic game lists. Others hate the game, even saying that the game's plot is joyless. Sonic Forces is nearly joyless. Wow, he's got like 10 terabytes of selfies. Did those people even play the game? And then there are people like me, in the middle ground. I see the flaws in the game, but the game also does have its merits. How's it going everybody? It's the True Blue Sonic fan here, and today I'll be reviewing Sonic Forces. Before we get started, this is going to be a long video. I'm basically going to be reciting the story, going deep in the gameplay styles, and dissecting the level design stage by stage. If you want to see a specific part of the review, check the description and there will be timestamps so you can skip parts. Let's first get into the selling point of Sonic Forces, the story and premise. Dr. Eggman has created a powerful new being. No Dark Gaia or Zeddy this time, this is his own monster. So Eggman attacks the city, and while Tails forgets his character development from the adventure games, Sonic runs through the sandy green hill inhabited by sandworms and destroyed Death Egg robots. He then reaches the city and destroys Robotnik's pathetic robot army, before getting beaten up by the new villain Infinite, along with Shadow, Chaos, Metal Sonic, and Zavik. Okay, I might have lied about there being no Zeddy. So far so good, minus Zavik of course. The story then progresses through just text on a screen. This is something I actually like about the game. The game just simply expects you to read what happens, and although you can call it lazy, I get this gritty, straight to the point vibe from it. The story continues as it shows the Resistance members, Vector, SPO, Charmy, Amy and Silver all in the computer room, and Knuckles later walking in to introduce your own avatar to the team. So here's my first problem with the story. Until we get to a certain part of the game, we're led to believe that the Resistance is a small team. They're described as ragtag, yet they have high-tech battleships that rival the ones Eggman uses. And I'm not saying just two or three ships. Look at this! This is a hell of a lot of ships, and it's never explained how the Resistance is so big and so powerful. Maybe if they said GUN supplied them with their weapons and ships, then it would have easily explained away the issue while adding a layer of fan service. But moving on, it's learnt that Sonic has been kept in space and tortured for six months, so the Resistance set off to steal a spaceship from the chemical plant up north. Meanwhile, Tails has apparently gone crazy and is trying to repair a damaged Omega, but he can't, and suddenly, Chaos attacks as he tries to grab Tails's. Um, well, let's not get into detail there. But hurrah! Classic Sonic leaves his homeland of Sonic Mania and arrives through a portal to forces. He saves Tails and stays irrelevant and shoehorned in for the rest of the game. Sure, Classic Sonic does some important things and contributes to the story, such as blowing up the Death Egg, but in the end, anyone could have taken his place. Also, Classic Sonic just one-shot Chaos and it took Modern Sonic 3 hits to defeat him. Just pointing that out. Now apparently, Classic Sonic is from another dimension, yet he's also the same one from Generations. My only guess is that when Classic Sonic, Tails, and Robotnik saw their future in Generations, the timeline split, and on top of that, the Phantom Ruby split the timeline further. After all the Classic Sonic jazz, it's revealed through a flashback that our avatar has encountered Infinite before, and that he slash she was a pussy and ran away screaming. We return back to the Resistance, where the team spy, Roost the Bat, informs them that Sonic is specifically being held on the Death Egg. The team head there and split up. I'm guessing as a result of their fighting, the Death Egg and its substations start receiving damage to their power sources. This frees Sonic of his plasma energy laser handcuff thing right after Zavik opens the prison cell to banish him into space. This allows Sonic to fight Zavik and kill him. When Zavik dies, though instead of rotting, he just disappears. Ooh, spooky. I wonder what that means. One thing people complain about forces is that Sonic seems way too cheerful after being tortured for six months, but it's important to remember what Chip taught us in Sonic Unleashed. And I quote, You're too strong to lose yourself. You never doubt yourself, no matter what. You never give in to the night or the darkness inside your heart. End quote. Continuity. But here's another problem. Within the story I have here, Rue said that Sonic was being held on the Death Egg, but apparently when Sonic left those other prisoners to die, he exited a smaller space station from outside the Death Egg. Then later, Sonic looks at the Death Egg and says, but they had me locked up on the Death Egg. Why would you think that? Do all the prisons around the Death Egg count as part of the Death Egg too? Was Sonic moved away from the Death Egg? If he just found out that he was being held on the Death Egg, how does he know that it wasn't all the other space prisons around the Death Egg? This isn't a major plot hole, but it's bothering me. Then Sonic says that the shuttle he came in must be around somewhere. 
It's been six months! I doubt it, unless he was moved from the Death Egg to the new prison, I doubt that there would be a shuttle nearby. Sonic then finds the Avatar who's having trouble taking out three badniks after defeating hordes of them in the previous two stages, but Sonic is luckily here to save the Avatar who is really close to the shuttle they were going to use to escape. Did they just give up on saving Sonic? Sonic catches up with his resistance buddies, but he doesn't ask why Silver's here. Sure, it's obvious that Eggman is dominating the world, and that would affect Silver, since he comes from the future, and if he wasn't there, Eggman would have won. Later in the story, he fights Infinite to trigger an important part of the plot, but like classic Sonic, he could have been replaced with Shadow. Maybe if Silver had important information from the future that helped him win the war, that would validate his involvement, but apparently the information in the future is very vague, as said in the prequel comics. Well, that doesn't matter anymore, because Sonic and the Avatar now have to blow up the Arsenal Pyramid in Green Hill. And the plot point is just dropped. Sure, we see a hole in the pyramid with smoke coming out of it in a later stage, but other than that, it's never mentioned. Eggman never says his forces are weaker, and no Resistance member celebrates their victory. Okay, whatever. A more important plot point arises right after the stage. Silver is battling Infinite, and Sonic needs to get there quickly to help out. This scene is probably one of the best in the game. You see Silver and Infinite fighting each other. Silver doesn't even hesitate to fight the guy who was able to take down Sonic. That's something he would do, and that's great to see. Sonic is the same, but he isn't serious at all. He throws jokes around like he should, but he's still serious when he needs to be. In this case, he's asking Infinite where his power comes from, but at the same time, incorporating jokes into what he says. Sonic, throughout most of the game, is written well to be honest. He balances the darker tones of the story with humor. Sonic fights Infinite, and then Infinite shows that he's still easily capable of destroying Sonic, but Infinite does what every stupid villain does. He says that Sonic is not worth finishing off, and leaves. It would have been better if Infinite was about to finish off Sonic, but Silver knocks Infinite out from behind, and as he gets back up like nothing happened, Sonic and Silver speed away. But instead, Infinite just doesn't kill Sonic. Great writing there. But, again, whatever. Let's keep going. Eggman and Infinite meet up in Green Hill, and Tails, along with Classic Sonic, chases him down. Eggman and Infinite talk about the Phantom Rubies, while Tails and Classic Sonic are listening from behind a rock. Eggman even gets mad at Infinite for not finishing off Sonic when he had the chance. Infinite implies that Sonic is older than 15, and when he leaves, Classic Sonic goes head to head with Eggman. Eggman reveals that the Resistance will be gone in just three days and retreats. At the same time, Eggman's Death Egg robots seem to have finally broken through the city's defenses, and the Resistance need to evacuate everyone. Although the stage seems to be filler, it's your Avatar's first solo battle. Sonic needs to heal, so he isn't able to tag along. At the chemical plant, the Avatar was accompanied by pretty much everyone, and he almost died on the Death Egg. But in the city, he was able to fight off all the enemies without any assistance and survived. Then when he comes back, everyone celebrates his victory. It's great to see that the Avatar isn't just there so you can be in the game. Rather, the Avatars have their own character development, so you'll be more involved in the story. Tails and Classic Sonic proceed to find Modern Sonic by searching around the area where he last fought Infinite. Rouge then detects two life forms around the area, and then the Avatar goes to check it out and finds Tails and Classic Sonic along with a prototype Phantom Ruby on the floor. They all return to the Resistance for Tails and Classic Sonic to be reunited with Modern Sonic. And Modern Sonic doesn't even question why Classic Sonic's here. Tails then tells the Resistance what he knows of Eggman's master plan, when Shadow suddenly starts attacking the Resistance forces in the city. Sonic goes to check it out and learns that Shadow, who was working for Eggman, was a fake. Apparently Rouge told Shadow about the fakes, so I don't know why the Resistance doesn't know. This scene could have gone a little bit better if Rouge was in the scene as well. She could have said something like, I found out that the Phantom Ruby could create fakes, and when the Resistance told me you went to fight Shadow, I tried to find the real Shadow. Continuing. At the same time, the Resistance goes for an assault on Metropolis, Eggman's base of operations, while they think Sonic is fighting Shadow. But then they say that Infinite can create illusions, which means that they should have known that the Shadow was fake, yet they said that Sonic was fighting Shadow right before the, the level. And I doubt that Rouge could tell the Resistance about the Phantom Ruby and find Shadow within the few seconds long encounter of the fake Shadow. But anyways, Infinite alone overpowers the Resistance, and apparently 80% of the Resistance was killed with the rest going missing. Jeez, this game is dark. The Resistance retreats, but the Avatar returns to fight Infinite. This scene could have also been done better. You see the, the Avatar imagine Sonic giving him words of encouragement, but the moment could have been a lot stronger if they used lines that Sonic actually said to the Avatar early on in the game. There's so many missed opportunities and plot holes in the story. I should have been there during the writing, and the story would have been 10 times better, and I'm not even a professional writer. How are they having so much trouble writing a cohesive story? 
But anyways, the Avatar was able to cancel the effects of Infinite's Phantom Ruby by using the prototype ruby he found earlier. And even though Infinite had the chance to finish the Avatar off physically without the ruby, he just leaves. Maybe if the Avatar got away while Infinite was confused about his ruby being cancelled out, then the story would have made sense, but Infinite is just an idiot. Seriously, if someone had the ability to cancel out your superpowers, why would you let them live? We then continue to Tails and Classic Sonic infiltrating the chemical plant to find out info on the Phantom Ruby. They figure out that the Death Egg needs to be destroyed since it's the power of the Phantom Ruby. But before they do that, they have to fight a fake Metal Sonic, even though Metal Sonic is a robot that Eggman can mass produce. I guess using the Phantom Ruby was a lot cheaper. So later they use the Avatar as a decoy to lead Eggman away from the chemical plant, while Modern Sonic breaks into the chemical plant to shut down the Death Egg's defense system. But oh no! The Death Egg has a secondary power source, so Classic Sonic fights his way into the Death Egg and destroys the power core. Is this the power core? Is the Death Egg powered by Eggporns running on a treadmill? Why are they facing the wrong way then? Why did they leave all the prisoners on the Death Egg to die? This game has so much death. Sure, it's off screen, but it happens. Well, after the Resistance blows up the Death Egg, Star Wars style, Eggman and the Resistance head for Metropolis. Eggman introduces Null Space to Sonic, a dimension created by the Phantom Ruby that has literally nothing. Sonic and the Avatar get sucked in, but strangely, Null Space has these weird structures and a road that leads to the exit. All Sonic and the Avatar need to do is double boost, which is something I'll get back to later. The scene would have had a way more emotional impact if Sonic decided to give up. Null Space is nothing, so Sonic and the Avatar are just floating there, waiting for the lack of oxygen to kill them. But suddenly, there's a glowing coming from behind the Avatar. He reaches back and pulls out the Phantom Ruby prototype, which then allows him to manipulate Null Space. A road forms and the oxygen appears around them. Sonic, feeling the most relief he had ever felt in his life, joins the Avatar in a double boost back to Metropolis. But no, that doesn't happen. Sonic just says, This isn't where we were meant to end up. Let's head back. Everyone's waiting for us. Another missed opportunity. Soon enough, the Resistance head for the Eggman Empire Fortress for a final battle against clones of Metal Sonic, Chaos, Shadow, and Zavik. Infinite creates a sun with the Phantom Ruby really close to the Earth without anyone burning up somehow. The Avatar uses their Phantom Ruby prototype to cancel the sun and save the day. I'd say the scene would be more powerful if the Avatar died after that, but the Avatar is supposed to be you in the game, so kids would obviously prefer if the Avatar survived. Instead, the Phantom Ruby prototype is destroyed as Sonic heads off to fight Infinite and beat him up with the Avatar by using the power of friendship. Eggman then presumably kills Infinite and pulls out a Death Egg robot that has the Phantom Ruby incorporated into it. Sonic, the Avatar, and Classic Sonic do a triple boost and destroy the Nega Wisp Armor ripoff. Again, this scene could have been way more powerful, but it's so underwhelming. For a final boss, the triple boost feels like a regular double boost because Classic Sonic adds nothing to the moment. Instead, all of Sonic's friends could have been teleported into the area. Maybe two friends for every combo that Sonic pulls. Then, at the end, all of them could have boosted into the boss together, really capitalizing on the fact that teamwork and the bonds of friendship can't be defeated, since that is the theme of the game. But they save the world, Eggman dies, maybe, Classic Sonic goes home, and your avatar leaves the team to pursue his own future. Overall, I think this is a solid story. It's only when you get into the details that there are plot holes, but the overall story is the best story we've gotten in a Pontact and Graph era Sonic story. All of the characters are in character, except for Tails, but everyone else acts the way they're supposed to. There are a few issues I have with the overall story. Firstly, we don't figure out who Infinite is. Sure, you don't need to know who a mysterious person is in a story, but the fact that Shadow knew means that the main game should have explained who Infinite was. Classic Sonic's return isn't explained either. Secondly, the game's story goes by so quickly. The main story takes place during the last three days of the six month long war. And the game is so short that the three days feel like three hours, which is also how long it takes to finish the game. And the story takes place on only a quarter of the earth. The map only spans across a quarter of the planet. The game should have been 20 times the size it already is. This would allow to expand the story and to explore the ideas brought into the game, but were never touched on, such as the prisoners in the Death Egg or Sonic being tortured. It doesn't feel like a struggle between Eggman and the Resistance once Sonic escapes. It feels like a typical day in the life of Sonic. 
we don't get to see a lot of characters' emotions that, that are caused from the war. This story is supposed to take place during a war, but it never felt like it. Maybe even expand the three day long story into ten days. Use Angel Island or Chaos actually returning to fight back with the Resistance. Maybe have a day and night cycle. Sonic Unleashed alternated between day and night. Each country has its own day and night. But Forces doesn't do that. If you go to Mystic Jungle, it's always night. If you go to Metropolis, it's always day. So the three day long story doesn't really feel like three days. It just kind of feels like a mess. So this review has gone for long enough. Overall, I'd give the story a 50%. To start off with this part, I'm going to be talking about the presentation. Generally, the presentation is beautiful. One of the best looking Sonic games to this day, in terms of graphics. The lighting is dynamic and the environment looks nice in terms of the textures and models. It's beautiful and I think the graphics are the strongest element of the presentation. On top of that, the cutscenes are done pretty well. The camera angles that I use in the cutscenes are the best from the series, but the animation is on and off. Within the whole game, some animations can be done really well. Take a look at this, for example. Sonic's animations are fluent and well done, but in this scene, the animation is awkward and stiff. Eggman, on the other hand, he is very well animated throughout the whole game. Whoever animated Eggman should have animated the whole game. He's animated so good! The voice acting is also the best from this era of Sonic voice actors. Who cares what it's called? What's important is to have a well thought out strategy. And paired with the dialogue in the stages, combined with the dynamic camera angles and music that I personally really love most of the time, keeps the game engaging. I'll touch on the music later, but let me just say that all of the Avatar stages have vocals that add to the Avatar's character and his or her thoughts on the situations. But this is where I have to get into the big problems. Although the game tries to be engaging with the war happening in the backgrounds of the stages, not really much happens, it's simply just Death Egg robots standing there and being shot or still battleships in the sky shooting lasers at each other. The game would be more interesting if somehow you interacted with those background elements. Maybe a ship from the sky gets shot down and Sonic has to run through it, or the Death Egg robot falls over and creates a bridge so the Avatar can use it to cross a gap. Heck, even Sonic's friends could have been used. Sonic could run into a rock wall and Knuckles could jump in and destroy the wall. Or Tails could fly me over to a gap that's impossible to jump over. This isn't necessarily bad because this is already more than what we get in your typical Sonic game, but they could have gone further with these ideas. On top of that, any cutscene that doesn't include the avatar is pre-rendered. Okay, so what's the big deal? The big deal is that Sonic Team can't, for whatever reason, make the video file look as good as the game itself. This isn't a big problem if you play in a room where your screen's on the other side of the room, but if your screen is right in front of you, you'll notice some cutscenes have some kind of graininess to them. On top of that, the cutscene that plays before the stage known as Imperial Tower is absolutely terrible. It has two parts to it, a pre-rendered part and an actual in-game part. The problem is the pre-rendered part isn't even at 480p. The cutscene hasn't even been rendered properly. Like, how? Why? Again, not a big problem if you're on one side of the room and the screen is on the other, but if the screen is right in front of you, it's extremely painful to watch. Also, half of the cutscenes are just voice text box. Seriously, why not animate these? It's just telling, not showing. In one stage, we have to reach a space shuttle, but we never see the characters boarding it, in it, or the shuttle actually taking off into space. How come the game has become so lazy? The story is mediocre, it has a good plot outline, and the characterization is done well, but in execution it was too short and generally terrible. Now Sega can't even bother animating the cutscenes. Again, like the story, there are good parts and bad parts, but the problem with the presentation aren't as bad as the story. And because the graphics and music are pretty great, I'm compelled to give this a higher score. I'll be giving the presentation a 70%. But next, I'll be talking about the controls. Oh boy, let's go. Starting with Classic Sonic, which is the worst gameplay style in the game. At first, by looking at trailers and gameplay footage, it seemed like Classic Sonic in Forces was an improvement over generations. It seemed like Classic Sonic's momentum increased when rolling down hills, which is definitely an improvement, but we didn't really know how much because the only demo we got for Classic Sonic was the Egg Dragoon boss, so we couldn't try him out in sloped terrain. But the game came out and I can say that, generally, Classic Sonic is a downgrade from Generations. 
First of all, even if Classic Sonic falls off a ledge and lands on the ground while rolling, he continues to roll. And if he starts to lose speed while rolling, he unrolls and starts running. Sure, he unrolls in the Classic games, but that's when he completely stops moving. On top of that, the jumping is atrocious. Jumping and holding one direction feels similar to Generations, but you can completely counter Sonic's momentum by tapping the opposite direction. This makes platforming a little frustrating, but it isn't too bad until you reach Iron Fortress, which is a stage I'll be complaining about later. The drop dash is fun to use though, and is a welcome addition to the classic Sonic formula, like it was in Mania. There is one problem with classic Sonic though, which sticks out like a sore thumb, and it's the terrible physics when you run into a wall or the ground. Let's say you spin dash off a ledge and into a wall. Instead of stopping your horizontal speed, the horizontal speed transfers into the vertical speed and you zoom down really quickly. Same thing applies to hitting a roof or floor. If you hit the floor with little horizontal speed, the vertical speed will transfer to the horizontal speed, and Sonic will start running at full speed with no run-up required. And speaking of run-ups, Classic Sonic speeds up too fast, and to be honest, I didn't find that too much of an issue. The issue I did have was that Classic Sonic had a speed cap when he was running. Look, he runs, gains a bit of momentum, but when he returns to the level floor, he goes back to his regular running speed and fails to get up the slope. And before you say Classic Sonic had a speed cap in Sonic 1, let me tell you this, I did not like the speed cap in Sonic 1. It didn't ruin the game, but it's definitely a problem. I'd also like to add a little nitpick here. You can't use the D-pad to control the characters on the PC version of the game. The PS4 version can, why not the PC? The D-pad works in the game since you can navigate through the level select with it, but it just won't do anything when trying to control the actual characters. This may not be a big problem to everyone, but I just find it extremely awkward playing Classic Sonic with a control stick. Overall, I wouldn't say the controls are bad because I still had fun with Classic Sonic, but they weren't decent either, they were just tolerable. Also, why doesn't the camera move when Classic Sonic looks up and down? Modern Sonic has a downgrade as well. When he's running slow, he controls really well, but he could have been less stiff when reaching his top running speed. His acceleration is slower, but then suddenly he just zooms forward, which can throw you off at times. It's important to note that this doesn't happen in the 2D section. Sonic is slower in those sections and doesn't go fast enough to reach the phase of his acceleration where he suddenly just zooms forward. When he jumps before his little zoom, there is no momentum, so once you let go of the joystick, Sonic just stops moving in the air. When you jump after the little zoom thing, you're carried by momentum and that is a very good thing. In Sonic Generations, jumping would slow you down, so it's cool to see that they removed it in forces. To some extent, although jumping in forces doesn't slow you down, landing sure does. It decreases your speed to just before the little zoom speed. I find that annoying. Classic Sonic doesn't do that. Adventure Sonic doesn't do that. So why does Boost Modern Forces Sonic have to do that? Modern Sonic is also impossible to turn when he's rising in the air, which I like since it requires more precision for platforming. The homing attack also requires more precision for you to lock onto the enemy. Although this works well in your regular stage, there is one boss where it becomes annoying, but I'll touch on that later. The air boost is kind of better in forces. If you time it correctly, you could use it as some sort of triple jump, but unlike in generations, the air boost can be used as long as you want in the air, just make sure you don't let go of the boost button. This lets the player easily skip sections, especially in Mortar Canyon, which again, I'll be addressing later on. The regular boosting is fine though, I like the addition of not being able to do a full jump or homing attack while boosting. It really adds some depth to the gameplay, and that's always appreciated. You also have the ability to quick step, which can come in handy sometimes since you don't have the drift in the game. There's also the stomp and slide, but the stomp is only useful in two stages, and the slide is useful in one stage. And that's when you're trying to collect number drinks. So the slide isn't even compulsory to use in the main game. And finally, you have the quick time events. They aren't really quick time events though. Instead of pressing a random button as quick as you can, you have to press the jump button when the larger ring shrinks down to the size of the smaller ring. Of course, when the ring is small enough, it disappears and you could die, but sometimes these quick time events are just for points or a better time. I would have really preferred if the quick time events were proper quick time events, but I guess Sonic Forces just had to use non-challenging quick time events with their already easy stages. But overall, Modern Sonic is good in terms of control. Better than colors, but the level design is where it all falls apart. Now the most important playstyle in the game is the Avatar. Literally, the Avatar creator is the best part of the game. There is a diverse collection of customizable parts in the game, and it seems like this is where most of the effort went into the game. Each Avatar animal species has their own abilities. 
the bear sends off enemies to damage other enemies when they're wire attacked. The bird can do a double jump, though this move is useless in the tag team stages, which I'll be covering later. The cat keeps one ring after being hit. The dog starts with five rings every time he dies. The hedgehog's rings last longer when dropped. The rabbit has longer invincibility frames when taking damage, and the wolf attracts rings. All these exclusive moves are useful, but they don't change the gameplay drastically. On top of that, you have the Wispins, or Wispons. These Wisp-based weapons can be equipped onto the avatar, granting them different abilities. Each Wispon has two abilities, the basic attack and their special action. The basic attack is self-explanatory, but the special action, while it can assist in combat, is mainly focused on assisting the player in platforming and can only be activated when you collect the respective Wisp for the Wisp on. The first Wisp on is the Burst Wisp on. Its basic attack unleashes a flamethrower that can be activated almost anywhere, while the special action is the ability to infinitely jump as long as your Wisp on power doesn't drain up energy. This Wispon is the first Wispon you unlock in the game, and is pretty broken. You can easily destroy all enemies by holding down the basic attack button, and you wouldn't need to worry about it running out of power. The Lightning Wispon is the second Wispon in the game. The Wispon creates a whip of lightning, and as you swing the whip, you get propelled forwards before stopping briefly. It also grants you invincibility as you swing the whip. Yeah, look at that. Its special action is the Lightspeed Dash and the Lightspeed Attack, so that's cool to see. Too bad Sonic doesn't have the lightspeed dash. The cube Wispon is a hammer. It can smash enemies, but if you don't touch them, they get trapped in these cubes. Then by touching them or using the hammer on the ground again, you can destroy them and gain 3 rings per enemy destroyed. The cube Wispon can only be activated when standing still on the ground, but it does grant you invincibility as you do it. If you activate its primary attack after jumping, you can actually use it as some sort of spin attack before it smashes the ground to trap the enemies around you into cubes. Its special action is the ability to create a tower of cubes underneath the avatar, allowing them to reach higher places. It's pretty useless throughout the whole game though, and I'd recommend the Burst Wispon over the cube if you want to reach higher places. The next Wispon is the Asteroid Wispon. You can shoot up to 5 projectiles at one time, but using it does slow you down. Its special action creates a shield around you, making you invincible for a limited amount of time, but it disables your primary attack. But on the bright side, you can hold down the special action button to float for a bit. Now we have the Drill Wispon. This Wispon launches you forward and destroys any enemy in your way, but you need to spam the primary attack button to charge it up. Its special action lets the avatar drill on the surface of the floor and up walls while also destroying enemies. Although this Wispon is disadvantaged in some areas, it can be used to skip large chunks of the game, as well as rip through one of the bosses. The next Wispon is the Hover Wispon. It can push enemies to destroy other enemies, but as a result slows the avatar down. And its special action lets the avatar float, obviously. It's pretty much an easier to control burst. And the final Wispon is Void, the Wispon you unlock when you finish the main campaign, but is also on the box art. The Void Wispon is pretty powerful. It shoots out a black hole-like void that sucks up enemies and collects rings. The Void Wispon has quite the cooldown time though, so you won't be able to spam it as you run. Its special action is to shoot you at light fast speeds forwards until you hit the limit or bump into a wall. And that's it. Other than those base Wispons, you can unlock Wispons that add skills to your avatar and Sonic if you're playing in the tag team stage. These can range from gaining rings when destroying an enemy or the ability to run at full speed after a stomp. In terms of general controls, the avatar feels like Sonic. Unlike Sonic though, the avatar can't boost or do a spin attack. Instead, the avatar has to jump on top of enemies, similar to like how Mario would. And obviously, the avatar lacks the double jump because it's a special move for just the bird avatars. The avatar's homing attack is also slightly different from Sonic's. It's called a wire attack because the avatar has to shoot out a grappling hook and pull themselves into the enemy, so the avatar's wire attack is slower than Sonic's homing attack. The avatar can also swing on specific grapple points. You can swing on red grapple points by pressing the jump button mid-air, but the yellow grapple points are automated, so you're forced to use them. I don't know why that was done, why not just make them all activated by pressing the jump button? It would make an already easy game slightly more challenging. But I do like the avatar. The biggest problem with the avatar is the Wispons are extremely overpowered, but it's still fun to play as. The final playstyle is the tag team. It's pretty much playing as modern Sonic and the avatar at the same time. And I guess I can see why the drift isn't in the game. I think Sonic Team wanted the tag team to flow well. Instead of switching characters at will, the move you make switches them automatically. 
and the primary attack button for the avatar is mapped to Modern Sonic's Drift button from Generations and Unleashed. And the only other button remaining is used to switch between your avatar and a rental avatar. This button simply allows you to switch between your avatar and some other randos avatar that you can optionally pick before you start a stage. And I mean, it has to be a random person. You can't pick your friend's avatar, which is really dumb. I don't know why they didn't think of that. That should be like the first idea that pops into your head. If you were going to pick a random person's avatar, I might as well I'll just use my own. Like, come on, Sega, I want to play with my friend's avatars, not just some random guy. That, that, that means nothing to me. But back to the tag team. This gameplay style does introduce the double boost, though, where the avatar and Sonic boost while holding hands to go faster than a regular boost. This could have been a good idea, but the level design really ruins the potential that the double boost had, since you don't need to do anything in the double boost section. There is a big issue that can really screw you over in the levels, though. And it's easier to show you than to tell you. You can see I'm playing as the Avatar right now, and I did a stomp. Now look at Modern Sonic. He's facing backwards. So when I boost, I boost backwards and I, it kills me. This... I don't... Why? Why doesn't Sonic boost forwards? Like, I'm the Avatar and I'm facing forwards, yet Modern Sonic's facing backwards and I just die. No, why? Uh... So yeah, because of this problem, I recommend walking a bit forwards before boosting right after you stomp as the avatar. Overall, good gameplay since it's just the avatar and Sonic combined. Here are some smaller issues that I have that wouldn't really fit in the categories I'm reviewing. For some reason, when modern Sonic and the avatar run off a ledge, they just continue their running animation like classic Sonic would, but they have a falling animation, so I'm really confused as to why they wouldn't use it. Also, you know those platforms that you can jump on, but if you approach them from the side or the bottoms, you just fly through them? Yeah, the top of those platforms have a small side collision. So even if you should be able to jump through one, you just end up colliding with the platform. There are also a few other moments like these where the game's a little unpolished, but nothing too game-breaking though. The PC version also has a few minor graphical bugs and can drop frames at times, but I think it was only doing that because I was recording. And finally, the ranking system is a step up from Generations. To get an S rank, it requires points rather than a time, so if you speed through most of the level and then lose your rings at the last moment, you might only get an A rank. But generally, it's still a pretty easy game to S rank. There's also no lives, so collecting more than 20 rings feels pointless on hard mode, Oh yeah, there are two difficulties in the game. Normal mode, where you drop 20 rings per hit, but can only collect a maximum of 100 rings. And you also have hard mode, which pretty much uses the same ring system as Classic, Dreamcast, and Color Sonic. I think normal mode should have been called easy, and hard mode should have been called normal, but I think Sonic Team wanted critics to not feel as if their hands were being held when they chose normal mode. Maybe. But as I was saying, no lives means collecting more than 20 rings feels useless, unless you want to S rank a stage but it's still pretty easy to S-rank stages, so it really doesn't even matter. Overall, I'd give the controls a 65%. Classic Sonic was tolerable, and Modern Sonic along with the Avatar were good fun, but there is so much more that could be improved on, especially with Classic Sonic. I mean, how do you, how do you screw up the physics so bad in this game? Eggman's forces are scattering bombs like confetti! <laughs> So, levels. I'll actually be going through all of the main campaign stages one by one because the game is a mixed bag when it comes to stages. Okay, so I just want to get some general issues out of the way that apply to most, if not all, of the stages. Firstly, all of the stages are very short. So short that you won't even hear the full tracks for some of these stages. Secondly, there's very little in Bad Nick variety. And lastly, the 3D sections are straight hallways and are not very open at all. The first stage is Modern Sonic's Lost Valley, which takes place in Green Hill. It's mediocre for a tutorial stage. Yes, it does introduce Sonic's moveset well, but the stage is so automated, it doesn't allow the player to experiment much with the environment, and that's its main weakness. The music is a little off, but it does reflect how Sonic is moving as fast as he can to get to the city. Other than getting rid of the automation, I think the stage should have ended with Sonic actually running into the city at the end of the stage, rather than running off screen. Overall, it's mediocre, it does its job, but 
it's pretty limited for the player. The second stage is the first Avatar stage, Spaceport, which is part of the Northern Chemical Plant. It's generally a fun stage and has the only 2D section with 3D movement. It's less automated when you actually get to play the stage and the automation is more cinematic compared to Lost Valley. There is one quick time event section, which I'll be referring to as QTEs from now where the avatar has to quickly react to obstacles four times. But only the last obstacle presents you with a QTE, and failing it brings you to an alternate path that lasts for just three seconds. The way the wisps are implemented in the stage is pretty meh, not really much to it. Also, I love the music in the stage, as it reflects the moment really well. Overall, Spaceport is a good stage. The third stage is the first classic Sonic stage, Ghost Town, which takes place in... City. Yeah, just City. It's called City. Freaking City. City Zone. You couldn't come up with a name for the city? Ugh, whatever. It's generally a fine stage. The level design is basic, but it's fun. Nothing special, and the stage doesn't take advantage of the ability to gain momentum. The music is also fine here. I think the over-the-top chip tune kind of adds this disappointment to the stage, as Tails discovers the whole city is being destroyed by Eggman. Overall, it's pretty average, but it's not something I'd come back to. Prison Hall is the fourth stage in the game and features the Avatar. The stage takes place on the Death Egg and is pretty automated. Although the drift isn't a move in the game, the Avatar has automated drift segments. And if you get to align the Avatar in the middle of the path, you get to hit a ramp that takes you up to an upper path of the stage, which obviously rewards you with rings and a better time. The 2D section has some decent alternate paths too. The third part of the stage, though, is a forced quick-step section. You can't stop moving forwards, and using the control stick makes you quick-step, even though the quick-step has dedicated buttons to it. I really don't know why they did that. They should have just given the player complete freedom to move. Limiting the player to just jumping and quick-stepping just makes the stage less fun, since you're not able to experiment and run around the area to your leisure. Maybe automating the stage makes it more difficult, since you can't slow down and have to react as fast as you can. Still, I disagree with automated quick-step sections. The wisps are also implemented in a pretty meh way as well in this stage. I think it could have been done way better. In terms of music, I absolutely love it. And like Spaceport, it reflects the moment well. Overall, I'd say Prison Hall is a good stage, but they really need to get rid of the automated quick-step section. The fifth stage is the first boss in the game, and it features modern Sonic fighting Zavik on the Death Egg. I have to say, it's a pretty good first boss fight. But because the homing attack requires more accuracy and forces, it does make the boss slightly frustrating as you try to lock onto the buzz bombers in this arena-like area. The music is fine, nothing too special, overall, great boss. It's original and it gets the worst character from the Eggman army out of the way as quickly as possible. Or you could just have no Zavik boss and just use Chaos instead because there's no Chaos boss in the game. The sixth stage is Egg Gate and it involves modern Sonic running out of the space prison he was in and escaping to the Death Egg's docking bay. This is a pretty great stage, not close to the greatness of generations, but still great. It's not very automated, features a few multiple parts, is one of the two stages that uses the stomp to actually progress through the stage, and when Sonic is running in the openness of space, it looks absolutely gorgeous. There's also this amazing looking QTE section at the end of the stage, which actually presents you with death if you fail them. The two biggest problems I have with the stage is that there are just two platforms in the beginning that literally do nothing, like they literally lead nowhere. And the second problem is that the badnik shooting lasers during the grinding segments shoot in the same pattern every Every time. The music is so hype in this stage though, and it's honestly one of the best tracks this game has to offer. Like I already said, overall a great stage, and such a shame that the stage is so short. The seventh stage is the first tag team stage, and takes place in Green Hill's Arsenal Pyramid. The stage is pretty bland though, it's pretty much jump on giant gears, take out circles of enemies, and repeat. The automated drift sections don't offer any reward for controlling the characters well. The double boost section requires no controller input once you finish spamming the boost button to activate it successfully, and the wisp bonds are used in a way that just helps you skip entire sections. You could argue that this is the first tag team stage, so it's meant to be easy, but the tag team stages are just modern Sonic and the Avatar's gameplay put together. You need no tutorial or easy stage to get used to the controls. This stage has two tracks, one that plays outside the pyramid and one that plays inside. The music that plays outside is pretty calming, but exciting at the same time, while the inside provides a funky techno too. Overall, the stage can be enjoyed, but it's really just mediocre at best, and I wouldn't come back to it unless I have to play an SOS mission. By the way, if you don't know what an SOS mission is, here's a screenshot explaining what it is because I'm too lazy to do it myself. The eighth stage is Luminous Forest, a modern Sonic stage that takes place in the Mystic Jungle. 
This stage is a terrible modern Sonic stage. Most of the stages just hold boost to win, with the only platforming being this bland 2D section where you jump over basic gaps and use these spinning platforms that are just placed in a row. There are some shortcuts, but to take them, all you have to do is homing attack some buzz bombers and the rest is just boost to win again. The stage ends with a QTE section. Failing the first QTE results in death, but the rest just result in taking a lower path that lasts for 3 seconds. Overall, the stage's level design is pretty much non-existent, but the music is exciting and keeps you pumped as you race towards Silver and Infinite. The ninth stage is a boss fight with Infinite. Obviously, you fight as Modern Sonic in the Mystic Jungle as you run around a snake. The whole stage is a reference to Sonic Lost World, a bad game. It's a pretty fun boss, the only problem I have with it is that it's like a Lost World mock speed section where you're forced to move forwards, but you still have a decent amount of control. The music is also a dubstep-like remix of Infinite's theme, which I really dig. Overall, a good boss. The boss could have been a little more intimidating though, but those sections where Infinite send you into a dark red alternate reality when touching his cubes do keep you on your feet since the cubes damage you, taking away all your rings unless you've collected over 20 rings on normal mode. Stage 10 is Green Hill. It takes place in... Green Hill. Wow. Original. This is a classic Sonic stage, and it's pretty basic. An average stage with not much to talk about. The momentum that Sonic carries isn't really used here either. The stage isn't as linear as people complained about though. They were just jumping to conclusions before the game actually came out. I like the music though. The overdone chip too makes it sound sad. And you should be sad since Green Hill has been taken over by... Sand Hill. The 11th stage is a boss fight against Eggman with a swinging sword blade before Classic Sonic whoops Eggman's Egg Dragoon in the egg. The boss is fine, but since we're already one third into the game, it should have been harder, especially when Eggman starts shooting you. The aim is random, which is more realistic, but makes the boss easier since his shots can miss you even while standing still. The music is great though, it starts off slow during the swinging sword blade, then it starts speeding up once the Egg Dragoon enters the scene. Overall, a decent boss, but it really should have been harder. The 12th stage is Park Avenue. This is a pretty good stage. There are heaps of multiple paths. The wisps are used pretty well in the stage. Not great, not good, but pretty well, pretty decent. And the music is really good. Overall, a good stage. The 13th stage is Casino Forest. It's a classic Sonic stage in the Mystic Jungle. It's your basic casino stage, and it straight up borrows gimmicks from Casino Night, Spring Yard, and Collision Chaos. Classic Sonic's physics can make the stage a little frustrating at some points, but you're not gonna die. The stage has some good multiple parts, and the music replicates the Genesis Sonic games pretty well. Overall, a good stage. I had lots of fun with it. Stage 14 is Aqua Road. It's a fun avatar stage that takes place in the Mystic Jungle. This stage is very automated because you spend most of your time riding on a stream of water, but keeping control on the flow of water can be quite a challenge, with the throwaway motor bugs trying to knock you off. There aren't any crazy multiple paths, and the wisps are, are barely used since most of the stage takes place on the stream of water. But what you get is decent. The music, which I love, doesn't really fit the stage. Overall, this is a good stage with actual difficulty, but it's just way too automated. Stage 15 is the stage that Sega loves to show off, Sunset Heights, and boy is it trash. I did make a video saying that the level is good because it's set up like a tutorial, and since it was the first stage Sega showed off, it was probably going to be the first stage in the game. Yeah, now that I know it's a stage from halfway through the game, it's terrible. Fantastic music though. The 16th stage is Capital City. It's an avatar stage that takes place in Metropolis. And no, it's not the Sonic 2 Metropolis. It's a new stage. While the level design is pretty basic, the characters talking to you on the radio saying they're under attack and giving stats on what's happening to the resistance forces gives a sense of urgency. I also love how Infinite messes with your mind and changes around gravity. Plus the music is on point. I love the stage because of the presentation and not really the level design. Of course, there could be a lot more improvements in terms of the presentation. We should have seen the resistance forces actually getting destroyed during the stage. The stage should have also had a bunch of Eggman propaganda videos in the background as well, to give a better sense that he's controlling the city, because the city looks fine. Overall, it's a decent stage, but the presentation is what makes it memorable. Stage 17 is the Avatar's boss fight with Infinite in Metropolis. The boss is pretty fun depending on what Wispon you use. Using the Hover and Void Wispon are probably the best ways to play the boss, since their attacks can't be spammed and don't affect Infinite, meaning that you'll have to wait until he dashes at you so you can perform a homing attack on him. They also don't grant you invincibility, so you'll actually be putting in effort to dodge attacks. Infinite could benefit from having invincibility frames, while the Wispons could, like, not grant invincibility while using them. The 18th stage is Classic Sonic's Chemical Plant. 
it takes place in Chemical Plant. Yeah, are you guys sensing a pattern here with the rehash classic stages? The stage is great, there's lots of vertical platforming and you can use your momentum to speed up in some areas. It's not linear. There's also this little nostalgic moment. Ooh, I better not fall. Oh, I even like the music. Despite how easy the stage is, I still find it great, even though Classic Sonic sucks in the game. Stage 19 is the Metal Sonic boss, but it's called Red Gate Bridge and is listed as a regular stage. The stage starts off with two QTEs. Failing both kills you. This cinematic moment is a battle against one of the Death Egg robots, which is really disappointing. They didn't create a full boss for the Death Egg robots, even though they were one of the marketing points for the game. The Death Egg robots were in every trailer, and they don't even get their own boss? Whatever. We move on to the Metal Sonic boss, which is a fun boss, but it's too simple and easy. There's also a double boost section, but it's just there for cinematic purposes. There is this one attack that Metal Sonic does that can only be countered by a few of the Wisp Bombs, and they can be used to get through the boss quicker, which is pretty cool. In terms of music, it's fantastic. The stage has two tracks. The first track is a peaceful melody played on the piano, while the second track is a techno dubstepy remix of the American Metal Sonic theme from Sonic CD. The Metal Sonic theme could have been less repetitive, but it was pretty exciting to hear. It's a decent boss, but because it's so easy, it really belongs around the beginning of the game. The 20th stage is Guardian Rock, boys! Obviously, this is the Green Hill Avatar stage that's been shown off in public demos, and it's a pretty great stage. There's a lot of platforming and risk involved, plus when you use a Wisp, it flows really well with the stage. Uh, most of the time. There's a forced quick step section at the end which sucks, but you have to keep focus on the game as rocks randomly fly at you, and you have to dodge them. The stage ends with a QTE that determines life or death, and a fantastic cinematic moment. The music is also fantastic, capturing the mood of the story and just being fun to listen to in general. Overall, a great stage that people don't like for some reason. The 21st stage is Network Terminal. This is modern Sonic stage that takes place in Chemical Plant. The stage begins in this nice and open grinding section outside the Chemical Plant that has a nice amount of multiple parts. The stage then continues to a 2D section inside the Chemical Plant. There are heaps of multiple parts and I really felt like I could take advantage of the extra height the air boost gives you. This stage is also the only stage that requires Sonic to slide to fit in tight spots, but it's optional and since none of the other game stages uses the slide, I didn't even know that was there until I was trying to find a number three. The stage also has two tracks, a catchy piece that plays as you rush into the chemical plant, and a calmer piece that plays inside the chemical plant that gives off this feeling of a stealthy and carefully planned infiltration. The whole stage is great and one of the better modern Sonic stages and it's paired with excellent music, making me want to come back for more. Stage 22 is Death Egg, which takes place in Death Egg. I bet you can guess who you play as in this stage. And again, this is a pretty great stage. There are heaps of multiple paths and verticality to the stage. A bit on the easy side, but let's just blame that on the fact that the egg pawns take forever to pull out their guns and charge their shots. The biggest issue I have with the stage is that there's a bottomless pit there, even though you're under the bottomless pit a few seconds prior. The music is pretty good too. I have no idea how to describe it, but it feels like a stylish infiltration. Well, I tried my best. In the end, great stage. The 23rd stage is Metropolitan Highway, a modern Sonic stage that takes place in Metropolis. This stage does start out strong, it's beautiful, and has level design that requires actual reflexes. But once you get to the skydiving section, it's all downhill. Firstly, you have rockets shooting at you while skydiving, but there are spots you can stay where the rockets don't even reach you. The rest of the stage becomes boost to win, but then transitions to this platforming section that rely heavily on this moving platform gimmick, and the stage suddenly isn't fun. Then we return to the 3D section where it's boost to win again. Music is fine though. The 24th stage is Null Space. Even though it's called Null Space, this is a tag team stage that mostly takes place in Metropolis. The stage begins in Null Space, but all you do is double boost out of it. And since double boosting requires no effort, you basically don't even need to interact with Null Space. When we return to Metropolis, we're greeted with a pretty great stage. Even though Null Space is very automated because a lot of the stage is spent on grind rails, if you take your time and explore, especially in the beginning, it can be quite an open stage. The stage even takes effort to get an S rank, and the stage music is fist bump. We've got it on the ropes! If all three can take the upper hand, we should have things under control soon! Yeah! Stage 25 is Imperial Tower. It's the Avatar stage in a place known as the Eggman Empire Fortress. 
This is the first and only stage you use the wall jump, and the second stage that requires you to stop. This stage has pretty good level design, and the wisps are integrated really well. The only issue is that your avatar is way too small to see. This isn't too much of an issue if the screen is right in front of you, but it is when it's on the other side of the room. The stage can also be a little frustrating without a double jump since there's a lot of bottomless pits, and if you lose your momentum, the avatar's slow acceleration will mess you up. The level is also pretty linear, but that doesn't bother me too much. As long as the level design is fun, I'm satisfied. But the music, boys! It's perfection, one of my favourite tracks in the game. It reflects the mood of the story perfectly, and hypes you up through the climax of the game. This is one of my favourite stages in the game, even with how frustrating it is. If you can get the hang of it, it's really fun, and the music makes it even better. Stage 26 is Mortar Canyon, a modern Sonic stage that takes place at the Eggman Empire Fortress. A lot of people like the stage and say it's really open, and it is at some points, but the level design is terrible. Just because there are little steps that have an extra 10 rings doesn't mean it's a good stage. A lot of stages is just either boost to win or homing attack to win. It's nothing special, and it's a really boring stage to play. Overall, it's a bad stage, but the music is pretty fitting. Alright, stage 27, the final infinite boss. The boss starts off as a modern Sonic stage, but halfway through it becomes a tag team one, which is cool. But other than that, it's literally just a slightly harder version of the Metal Sonic boss. Yeah, lazy. Music is nothing special either. This is a bad boss that doesn't even show how powerful Infinite is. This boss was really disappointing for a character that helps Eggman take over the world and beat Sonic at the beginning of the game. Stage 28 is bad. It's called Iron Fortress and takes place on, you guessed it, the Eggman Empire Fortress. It's a classic Sonic stage and it's got this auto-scroll section, but because classic Sonic's physics are weird and terrible, I died a lot on my first try. I also died a lot at the end where there's this cinematic moment of Classic Sonic outrunning rocket fire, so either I jump over the dash panel, get hit by the rockets and fall off the stage, or the rockets would activate while I land behind the dash panel and destroy the bridge before I'd get a chance to run on it. So I'd have to kill myself to reset the bridge. The music, although not bad, didn't really fit with the direction of the story. I love the spinny things from Scrap Brain though. The 29th stage is Final Judgment. It's a tag team stage and it isn't as exciting as the game sounds. You begin in this forced quickstep section, and at some points there are these invisible walls that prevent you from quickstepping and make the stage really frustrating. Then you have this cool part where you have to destroy a reactor, but you can get through it really easily if you have the wisp bombs that grant you invincibility. Then another doubles boost section that requires no input. Although I really do like the music. The overall stage though is terrible. The 30th stage and final stage is the Death Egg Robot boss. It's nothing like the Death Egg Robot though. The first phase of the boss is a classic Sonic stage. It's basically a better version of the Egg Dragoon boss from Green Hill with lasers that can actually hit you and a destructible environment. The second phase of the boss is an avatar section. This part is completely original and I really enjoyed it, but it can be really easy once you find out why you're attacking the boss's body takes a lot of health away. The boss should have had invincibility frames so some of the wisp bonds couldn't just obliterate the boss with no effort. The ground is also destructible, so some of the boss's attacks can change the terrain. The third and final phase is the modern Sonic section, but the avatar and classic Sonic follow you for effect. It's a dumbed down version of the Nega Armor boss from Sonic Colors. I did find the music extremely impressive, from how it gave a sense of distress and desperation to a more powerful, heroic theme at the end. Overall, the first phase of the boss was pretty decent, and the second was good. The last phase was fun, but the rehashing was so blatantly obvious it kind of ruined the boss. It wasn't even a harder version, it was an easier version of the Nega Armor boss. Overall, this is a decent final boss, but as a boss, it, it should have really been harder. So, what's my final verdict on the stages? I have none. It's a mixed bag, and there's no way I can conclude what I think about the level design as a whole. But if I had to rate the level design's average quality, it'd have to be a 60%. But I'm not done with Sonic Forces just yet. In the next part of my review, I'll be talking about the extras and wrapping up the review. The first form of extra content in Sonic Forces are the red rings. There are five red rings hidden in each stage. They do nothing. There, there are missions like collect 25 red rings or collect 50 red rings that will unlock 6 customizable parts and wisp bonds for your avatar, but you're not earning an avatar part per red ring, so it doesn't feel worth it. The red rings don't do anything else, there's no concept art in the game or extra music or 3D models. Collecting all 5 red rings in a stage allows you to collect numbered rings. Collecting the number rings from 1 to 5 in that order does nothing. 
But look, there's a mission that unlocks six parts and wisp ones when you collect all of them. Yeah, no, it's not worth it. Maybe if you unlocked six parts for every stage you collect the numbered rings, it would be fine. But that is not how it is. Once you collect all numbered rings in the stage, you get to collect the silver moon medals. Once you collect one medal, you get a limited amount of time to collect all five medals in the stage. Once you reach that time limit, you fail and get no moon medals. This has the exact same problem as the numbered rings. The amount of parts and wisp bombs you unlock is not worth it compared to the medals that you collect. On the other hand, you have the secret and extra stages. The secret stages are side stages, they're pretty much the filler stages from Sonic Colors. I mean, look at them, they use the exact same gimmicks. There's 6 of these stages in total. They're really short, but they're worth playing compared to collecting the red star rings, numbered rings, and silver moon rings. The extra stages are side stages, they're pretty much the filler stages from Sonic Colors. I mean, look at them, they use the exact same gimmicks. There's 7 of these stages in total. They're really short, but they're worth playing compared to collecting the red star rings, numbered ri rings, and... oh. And oh no, looks like Classic Sonic doesn't have any side stages at all, of course! But my biggest problem is that there are only 13 side stages in total. Sonic Generations was in development for 2 years compared to Forces 3, and it had more side stages and longer main stages. Finally, we have missions. Like I mentioned before, some of these missions involve collecting a specific number of red rings or numbered rings. There are missions like Spin Attack 3 enemies in a row, which are obviously really easy to complete. But there are missions that ask you to finish stages with an S rank, and to finish them within a certain amount of time. Time, which I'd say are worth completing because you get six customizable parts and wisp ones for every mission you beat. Unless we're talking about the red rings, numbered rings, and the silver moon medals. Overall, I'd give the game's extras a 50%. There are some missions and stages that are worth completing, but there are some that aren't worth it at all. It's like the stages, a mixed bag. And even if all the missions were worth doing, there are barely any real extra content. 13 side stages compared to Generations 90? How? Why is this acceptable? How could Sonic Team make a game with over 100 stages in total in 2 years then make one with less than 50 in 3? It's just embarrassing. Okay, so overall I'd give the story a 50%, the presentation a 70%, the gameplay a 65%, the stages a 60%, and the extras a 50%. Using basic maths, that would give Sonic Forces an average score of 59%. So yeah, that's Sonic Forces for you. I had fun with the game, definitely. But I was also underwhelmed and disappointed in it most of the way through. It wasn't a bad game, but it wasn't good either. Just okay. Sega really need to step it up with their next Sonic game. But until then, we still have Sonic Mania. If you have made it this far into the review, wow, you're a trooper. But that concludes my Sonic Forces review, guys. And like always, I'll be seeing you guys in the next video. Wait, are those soap shoes? Sonic Forces gets an instant 100%. Yeah.